Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. It's a story that would go on to change the world, but it happened so long ago that we forget. You know, the same way you can forget what you got last Christmas. And yet here we are, the same thing year after year. We decorate, we rush, we shop, we wrap, we open, we invite, we attend, we eat, we celebrate, we box it all up, wait 12 months, and we do it again. But there's more to the story, more than a tree, more than gifts, and more than just another holiday. And we all want there to be more to this season. The thing is, God knew that. In fact, that was his plan all along. He wants us to have more, more joy, more peace, more of Him. He gave us the perfect gift, and it wasn't wrapped neatly under a tree. The gift He gave wasn't a virgin mother or wise men. It wasn't angels, a star, or a manger. The gift He gave was and is the person of Jesus, fully God, but completely human. The gift was that He clothed Himself in humanity and embarked on a rescue mission, one that would give hope to all mankind and the story that would change the world forever began like this. Happy New Year. It's good to see you guys this morning. Uh, Yeah, I didn't know if anybody would be here but me. (laughs) All right. Well, I hope you had a terrific Christmas holiday. I know my family and I did. We enjoyed it. You know, in every family, there's got to be the person that's like at the Christmas cheer, right, and, and promotes it in their family. Well, that's me, right? I like to do all the, uh, you know, directing of the Christmas holiday. I get everybody involved in being able to decorate the house and the tree and, you know, to make the dinner and stuff like that and to wrap all the gifts. And especially, I love to get them all to coerce them to sit and watch Christmas music, you know, the Christmas movies with me, right? I really love that aspect of it. And one of my favorite movies that I watch every year is It's a Wonderful Life. Now raise your hand if you've seen that. Yay, right? We almost everyone here has seen that. It's classic movie. It's, it's a great movie. Well, in the beginning of that movie, they make a very powerful statement uh, that, that opens it up. And I want to talk to you about that. It's where Clarence, who's a second great angel because he doesn't have his wings yet, right? He's getting ready to get an assignment. And the assignment uh, that he's given is coming from Joseph, the head guy. And so he calls Clarence. Clarence comes, right? This is happening in the cosmos. And the angel says, hey, I need you, Clarence, to go down and help this guy, George Bailey, because he's really bad off. And so Clarence says, what? Is he sick? And I love what the head angel says. He says, it's worse than that. It's far worse than that. He's discouraged. He's discouraged. And I I like that line because discouragement or lack of hope is almost as bad, if not worse, than a physical illness. You know, when life kind of knocks us down and kind of beats us up, right? And we find ourselves discouraged and without hope, and we start to wonder, does our life even matter? Well, actually, the Bible speaks to this, right? In Proverbs 13, 12, it says this, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And the Good News translation actually says, when hope is crushed, our heart gets crushed, right? And so today, as we conclude our series that we've been in and, you know, God's gifts to us, and we've been unwrapping those, today I want to talk to you about the gift of hope that he gives us. And I want to unwrap it, and I believe it's a very timely word for us going into this year, 2017. Now, Would you bow your heads with me? And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to even come more than he is. Father, I thank you. I thank you for just waking us up this morning and causing us to hear what you have to say. Father, I can talk a thousand words, but one touch from you, Lord God, and and we feel that we have all that we need in life. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would move amongst us as you so choose, Lord God, opening and reaching each heart that you have pre 
determined to hear this word today. Now, Father, embolden me, give me clarity that I might see where you are. I love you, Father, and trust you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, guys, the human spirit, it needs to have hope in order to not just you know, survive, but to thrive in life. So it's by no surprise that God leads us to himself, to his son, Jesus Christ, to be able to find that ultimate hope, right? We see that in the scripture in Romans 12, 13, it says this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? So God is saying to you and I that he has this hope to give us, that he has given us, and this hope is so powerful that it has the ability to transform a human being, that this hope that he gives us can rewrite our eternity. But this isn't usually the type of hope that you and I think about, right? Or the hope that we normally talk about in our everyday conversation. Rather, that kind of hope is the hope that we have in the power that we carry ourselves to change maybe a situation that we're facing. Kind of like that movie I was talking about with George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life, right? He had a huge problem, and he was trying all kinds of ways within his own strength to answer it. And when he couldn't find the answer, he even went to his nemesis, right? Old Mr. Potter to try to get him to help. And when everything started to fall apart and he himself couldn't get that thing to be solved, he falls into hopelessness, right? By his own efforts, he couldn't solve it. So he falls into this hopelessness. And then he starts to question, does his life even matter? See, the hope that we're seeing there is hope that happens often with people that it's contingent, that hope is contingent on them being able to solve something. Yet the Bible says to us that hope can go beyond the circumstances and our own power to solve something. The hope for the Christ follower is this assurance in the belief that God is willing and he's able to fulfill the promises that he has given us. And that this hope that he wants to give us is a living hope. It's a living hope because it resides in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, look at your scriptures. In 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4, it says this, In God's great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, and it's kept in heaven for you. Do you see that? This hope is, is all revolving around the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It showed us that he was truly God and that he has the power, right, to give us a living hope to fulfill the promises that he makes to us. What promises are these, Sharon, that you're talking about? I'm talking about the promises he makes to us, the promise that he can change our lives, this promise that he will guide and lead us, this promise that says he will never leave us nor forsake us. It's this promise that he gives us that he will give us comfort when we walk through those hard places and that we will have, he'll be able to use, he promises that he'll use the things for Christ followers, those personal problems that they're encountering, he'll use them to create good that will come out of it. And then there's the promise that he gives us for eternal life, that we will be with him in heaven. You see, that's the kind of hope that I'm speaking about this morning. That's the hope and trusting in Jesus Christ that he can accomplish all that he promises us, no matter what situations we might face. Do you see the difference in the hope that I'm talking about this morning? Hebrews 6.19 says this about this type of hope that God gives us. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. It's an anchor for our soul, and it keeps us firm and secure. So God wants to give us this hope that you and I can have an anchor in our lives, that we can stand firm on it no matter what's happening around us, then that we can be secure in it. That's what he wants to give us. That's what he wants us to unpackage. So the question then becomes, Sharon, how do we do that? How do we let this hope kind of flow out of us, right? In our daily lives, especially when we're facing situation that seems so hopeless or a relationship that seems so hopeless. Well, on your outline, I've put down some things I think 
that you could do and I can do to help partner up with the Holy Spirit to allow this hope that God has given us to flow through us and in our lives. And these things, if you engage in them, then it does usher in the Holy Spirit to allow this peace and this hope to come into your life. So look on your outline. The first one seems maybe obvious to you. It's this. I must remember God is with me. I must remember that God is with me. The first time, you know, often the first feelings of hopelessness comes when we are, are thinking that, hey, well, I'm on all on my own. If it's to be, it's up to me, right? And so we try to go about solving these problems ourselves, and it's like we forget God. Yet in Job 8, 11, it says, those who forget God have no hope. And so Job is reminding us, the book of Job, that if we forget to put God in the equation, then soon we will be led to a place in our situation where we have no hope. Now, I, I personally think it's kind of ironic that you and I live in America where we have all this media that's going on around us. So we hear about God a lot. And especially in the Christmas season, you've been hearing about his son, Jesus Christ, a lot. But people, they don't seem to get it. Even though they're hearing it, they don't get it. Why? Well, because I think that they fail to hear that the call is for them, that this good news is for them, right? That, that he wants to forgive them for their shortcomings, that he wants to help them in their sins and to bring them back and restore them as children of the God Most High, that the call is actually for them, and they, they fail to hear that. Instead, they just hear the information, and it goes over them, it washes over them. You see, God makes it his plan to make sure that he lays out for all mankind to hear about this good news that he has through his son, Jesus Christ. And then he stands back and he waits for what will we do about it? Will we receive it into our own lives on a personal level? Will we grab hold of it and accept it? The Bible says those that believe in their heart and confess with their mouth, so shall they be saved. That's how you enact that in your life. And if you're in here today, maybe you came because it's a new year or a family member invited you, but God came. He wanted you to come here today. He brought you here to hear that you matter to him and that he indeed is calling you not just to hear the message, but to respond to it, to respond to it. Now, I have discussed with a lot of Christ followers who have made that decision to follow after Christ, and they've even asked him to be the leader of their life. Yet, yet, they tend not to involve God in their problems, right? Not at the front end, maybe at the back end when it's all falling and they yell, oh God, help, right? But not at the front end. It's almost like we're so self-reliant that we just kind of forget that God is there. And so we try to answer issues in our lives by our own strength, kind of like George Bailey does. And I know because of this, this whole idea of the self-reliance, I have, right? I was brought up, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, girl. And so I'm fiercely independent. And so for me, this, this speaks directly to my heart. You know, when we started this church, we were in rented facilities for years. <laughs> and one of the ones we had, the third one, we were in the cinema cafe. And what that meant for us as a church plant is that Every Sunday, we would have to get up like at the crack of dawn and bring all our equipment into the cafe. We would wear our work clothes because we'd have to clean the cafe. It was very dirty. And then we'd have to set it all up for the, you know, the, the uh, three theaters. We'd set them up so that we could have church uh, service twice that day and be out by 1230. And we would do this with our volunteers. Well, that first year went by. And you know what? It took a toll on my health. It hit. It hit my health, and my strength seemed to be drained. What happened was I developed an inner ear problem, uh, which totally took my equilibrium away from me and would often render me flat on my back until it could upright itself. And so I was losing my strength. It was kind of being drained out of me. And I began... Uh, to that, that following year began to really battle with my emotions, begin to battle with why is it so difficult with my health, you know, and so hard to plant this church and, and try to do life with raising children and working outside, you know. And so I began to be very tired and very weak, and I began to be filled with anxiety and doubt 
and hopelessness. And I began to wonder about the faith of the church. I began to, to play the what if game, right? What if? What if I never regained my strength? What if I was never healed? What if I was never able to help lead this work with Andy? And so I would play the what ifs. And as I played those, I began to think, what if? What if the church just blows away and goes away after all the hard work and, and following after God? And so I was filled with anxiety and doubt and despair. And you can hear the, the hurricane of emotions that were going on, right? And it was in the midst of that, for months of that, that all of a sudden God's, that, that still small voice that I could hear, that's God's voice in my heart, that said, Sharon, Sharon, whose church is this? It's yours, Lord. It's yours. Then he told me, then let me be responsible for it. You don't worry about it. Well, I said, okay, God, that's a good plan. <laughs> you know, that's a good plan. But how many of you know that the emotions don't go away just like that? I had to learn how to be emotionally sober in that process. And so I began to memorize scriptures. I began to study God's word like I never had before. And so I came about scriptures like this in Psalm 94, 19, I put on your outline. It says, Lord, when doubt fills my mind and when my heart is in turmoil, quiet me and give me renewed hope and cheer. Do you see that? And so I would call upon the Lord that he would do that for me. Now you fast forward into 2016. And if I hadn't told you that story, you wouldn't even know about it. Why? Because God was faithful to take care of his church and to take care of me. Now, I wish I could say, lessons learned, I got that. But you see, this reliance of self is something that I struggle with. I, I think about often. And so God often gives me on my plates things that challenge that. One of them is this very uh, replayment of the loan we've been talking about, right? Right? I do a lot of battle emotionally with that one. You know, I want to I wanna take the problem myself. I want to wrestle it down. I want to tell the Lord what we're to do here, right? And he just goes, whoosh, whoosh, girlfriend, <laughs> back up. I'm doing the driving. Now, how many of you know it's hard not to drive to be a passenger? It is really hard for some of us to be in that position where we are a passenger. You know, we just want to grab the wheel and drive the thing yourself, Right? But God says, no, I got this one. I want you to sit and ride along with me. And so I've had to go back to that scripture, and I've had to say, okay, God, quiet me that I might hear you, that, that my hope might be renewed in you and my joy, right? And so I'm right back there again, but I know that I'm growing tremendously through this experience. And Pastor Andy, when he was up earlier, he told you that we have collected $121,000, right? I hope. <laughs> so we only have 38000 left or so. That's nothing. I mean, God is doing huge things. But I wanted to bring you some of the stories that have been happening behind the scenes because I want you to be inspired by the sacrificial giving as I have been. You know, we brought to you some of those big uh, stories or big gifts that people had given and I love that because that kind of helps set the pace for us, right? That kind of helps to lead us to, towards that goal that, yes, we can do it when we get infused with those larger gifts. But God is working constantly. Just two weeks before uh, uh, the um, Christmas, Christmas uh, service, I got this letter here. It says this. The purpose for this quick note is to let you know that sharing your heart and God's uh, direction to bring to us on the information of how we needed to pay off our church building has been on my heart for weeks. You see, I have been religiously uh, saving for a renovation for my home for over the past year, couple years. We want to add a garage and do a patio, screening patio. However, I believe that in the last week's service, God clearly said to me, build my house first. So I plan to delay my work on my home, and I've caught, I want to get behind the faith to be a part of paying off this church building loan. I, I did give you a gift of $1,000, and I checked it off my things to-do list thinking, I got it. I've done that. 
But God had a bigger thing in mind here. At the end, he said to me, give, he said to me, I want you to give all your renovation money, all 10,000 of it, to contribute it to the work that is being done at the Vineyard Ministry. And so I have done that. Now, I think that's amazing. I think that's amazing, right? Well, those kind of stories are happening all around us. Here's another one. There was a, a couple I was praying with who own a townhome. They had gotten it in hopes that they could use the revenue to help them in their retirement, right? But they soon found out it wasn't working that well, and they started losing money, so they knew they had to get rid of that piece of property. So they were talking to me about praying with them that they just wouldn't lose so much money, that they could just get out of this, that there was a buyer for them. And so I said, okay. And so they started to pray. I was praying. Then all of a sudden they came back to me and they said, hey, we're not praying just that we would sell the, the, uh, the town home. We're praying that we not only lose the money, but that God would make us money, right? And that we would be able to give it to the, to the church. And you know what? That house sold fast. And they made $3,000 on it, and they gave it to the church, right? See, this faith that's being building, you know, to reach out beyond what's happening. And then there's a story where the stories I've had with many people that have been with us for a long time, and they have given faithfully. They make pledges to us to help buy a building and to renovate it, and, and they're so faithful to complete that. And yet when they heard this, uh, they felt impassioned as in their in their prayer time to join those other folks in this church to jump on board again and to give even more more than they'd already given their share but they are now moving beyond that you know i find this so so um inspirational to watch the love that they have and then there's this uh, elderly widow right she lives on social security she gave a check for 500 dollars to the church right above her tithe she gave that you know this is a woman who gives probably about five percent of her total yearly income to this project and then she did that what the lord reminded me it's like the widow who gave those two little mites you know those two little copper coins and jesus looked at her and said that she had given more than anybody because she gave out of the heart right and just when i thought oh lord <laughs> this is amazing god brought me another story right during the Christmas time. And this is a story about a sweet young lady who's mentally challenged, who's in one of our small groups that we offer on a Tuesday uh, to those folks. And, and she heard about us collecting money to pay for this building, right? And she was so impassioned that this was her home and that she loved this church, that she decided she wanted to give $900. That's huge. Of course, I went to her caregiver, and I talked to her. I said, like, well, does she know what she's doing here, right? And I started to talk to her, and the caregiver starts to explain to me what was happening here. And I was so cut to the heart about her faith. It was huge. She gets it, right? She gets it. And you hear the, the, just the total conviction of my struggles and yet here's a young woman who's mentally challenged she's leading me in my faith and my love do you see that it's huge well i became undone as you can even see right and i thought i can't take any more lord <laughs> and then on friday this past week i got a call from a man who's not even you know who well it came and anyway i got a call and the call was about a man who's not even part of our church. He's not a member here, but because he's close with a, a family that comes here, and that family has been sharing with him, he asks them, he goes and he seeks them out, and he asks them, what are we doing with the social injustices in our community and around the world? And he's been so uh, compelled to want to be part of that that he, he had called us up and said, hey, I got a $12,000 check I want to give to you. I want to give to you this week, right? I mean, oh my goodness. These are stories that are happening to me. They're amazing. That's, what, that's why we have 121000 that we've collected so far from these kinds of stories. They're amazing. But let me tell you what I'm seeing happening. It is not about 
just the, uh, the, the completion of this goal to, to pay off this renovation of the building. It's not that at all. God is working behind the scenes spiritually to uplift us and to grow us and to challenge us that he is with us, that he is for us. And because he is for us, no one can stand against us, right? And what's impossible for you and I is not impossible with him, and we need to trust him, and he's teaching us to walk in that and to grow in that. That's the big idea. That's what he's doing with this whole campaign. And so we still have five more days if you want to jump in and do what God is uh, moving uh, many to do. Uh, and we say around here it's not equal gifts but equal sacrifice, meaning you come with what you have, and God makes it enough. Remember, God is with us. Now, the next thing to remember when we're partnering up with the Holy Spirit to help usher this hope in is number two on your outline. I remember that God cares about me. He cares about you. You matter to him. You know, verse after verse, I see where God is saying, I care, I care about you so much. In Lamentations 3, it says this, I have hope when I think of this. The Lord's love never ends, circle never ends, right? His mercies never stop. They are new every morning, every morning. Is that really possible that God could, could love us like that? I mean, we look at human love and, and we see it all over the place that human love collapses. It doesn't normally last, does it? Why is that? Because human love is conditional, but yet God's love is unconditional, he doesn't have conditions on it, and because of that, he just goes and loves us endlessly. And so my question then becomes, have you ever felt God's unconditional love for you? Have you ever really felt it? I know you heard about it, you think about it, but have you ever felt it in your life? You see, I think there's so many of us, we struggle inside, don't we? We struggle with this whole concept of, I know God loves me when I'm doing well, but does he love me on the bad days as much as the good days? You know, does he love me in spite of all my flaws, my sinful nature, those things that I don't seem to be able to defeat in my life? You know, those, those dark places that I go to. Does he really love me unconditionally? You know, a guy named Henry Nolan, Nolan he wrote a book called The Prodigal Son, and he talks about this picture that Rembrandt had, uh, had uh, painted. And, and everybody knows, or most of you know, about the, the prodigal son, right? That whole story you can go and look at Luke 15 and, and read about if you don't. But the son, what he does in a synopsis here is the son goes to the father and he says, Father, I want my inheritance now. The father capitulates and gives him his inheritance. He takes it and goes to a distant land and he spends it all on and blows it on wine, women, and song, right? And when he's destitute and he has nothing, he comes back to the father, right? And he said, Dad, I really blew it here, right? And he falls at the father's knees. And instead of the father rejecting him, instead of the father scolding him and giving him a lecture, he welcomes him home and he just puts him in a loving embrace. And so Rembrandt has painted this picture of the loving father scene. I wanted you to see it. So why don't you put that up on the screen? What I want you to notice here in the center is this loving father uh, accepting his son back and, and offering forgiveness. But I also want you to notice the people on the side that are watching. Now here's what uh, Henry Nowen says in his book, and I'm going to quote it. For years I instructed students on the different aspects of the spiritual life. But one day I realized as I looked into the picture that I had never really dared to step into the center of that picture, to kneel down and to let myself be held and to be forgiven by God. I was so struck when I read that. I was struck with it, and I wondered how many of us, we've never really dared to step into that place of total uh, unconditional love. We are like the bystanders. We've been watching about it. We've been talking about it. But have we ever dared to come forward and to fall at the Father's knees and to be able to feel his unconditional love? To be able to feel that love, you have to move from a, from a bystander, a watcher, to a participant where you come and you kneel before the Father. That's how you, that's how you get that unconditional 
love. You have to trust him enough to go to him in the midst of those times when you are, are afraid or you have problems and you don't have it all together, but you go seeking because you know you'll be accepted, that he has unconditional love for you no matter what. It's those places that we remember that he cares desperately and deeply for us. The next thing we can do to partner up with the Holy Spirit to allow this hope to flow that I've been talking about is to remember that God knows your situation. He knows our situation, right? He knows the problems that you're facing. He knows what hurts your heart. He knows that. He knows about your habits and your hangups and your hurts. In Psalm 56, 6, he says this to us. You know how troubled I am. You have kept a record of my tears. He actually keeps a record of your tears. Every tear that comes out of your eye from, the, from, from whatever, joy or pain, he captures them and he keeps them. He has record of them. Every tear that you have shed has not gone beyond God's compassionate gaze. He loves you. He's looking at you. He understands what you have gone through, what you are going through right this minute, and what's going to come down the pikes in the future. He knows that about you, right? He's an up-close and personal God. He's up-close and he is personal. And so you've heard it said, well, nobody knows what I'm going through. God knows what you're going through. And he's there with you. Matter of fact, God knows better what you're going through than you know what you're going through. How do I know that? Because he says one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to intercede for us when we are in such a confused place, in a hurting place, he actually sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit starts to intercede you know, for us and groans and makes petition before God himself. We see that in Romans 8, 26, it says this, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groaning. You know, wordless, when you've been in so much turmoil, you're confused and you're in so much pain, when you go and you don't even know how to pray and you just start to pour out your heart, the Holy Spirit comes in you and it starts to intercede. And so God brings up that, that pain and that, those confusions and he puts them right before his very throne. He's made that effort because he cares about you. He's always with you in your life. And so if you're facing some hopeless situations and, and relationships, I want you to remember that God is with you, that he cares about you, and he sees everything that you're going through. And then the next thing on your outline, how we can partner up with the Holy Spirit to be able to walk out this living hope that he has given us is number four. Remember, God has power that you don't have. God has power I don't have. So God wants us to be assured that he has power to address what's going on in your life, right? This is the God we're talking about who has created everything around us in the heavenlies. You know, when you look at the sun, he created the sun. And did you know that the sun's uh, burst of, of, of energy, you know, just for one minute is more energy than the whole of humanity will use in all its history. And that's just one, one planet, one thing that God has created out of the trillions that are all around us. He has this infinite power and he says, I want to leverage that to help you where you're at, right? He has this power that you don't. He has enough. And he tells us here in Luke 18, 27, what is impossible for man is possible with God. He says, it's just a matter of getting that concept in your mind that he has all the power. You might not have it, but he has it to give you, right? And so he never gets, and because I know that, he never gets tired of helping me. He never gets fatigued or loses energy, right? There's no things what I call rolling blackouts. <laughs> Sharon, you were so needy last, you know, last week. You've used all my energy. I have nothing for you this week. There's no rolling blackouts with God. He's always there. He's always there with his power to help you. And what's impossible in your life is possible with him. We just have to understand that and plug into it. In Romans 4.18, it says this, When everything was hopeless, Adam believed anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he couldn't do, but on the basis of what he could, or what, on the basis of what God said he could do. 
what God said he could do. So what I want you to see here is that each and every one of us will face things in our lives that are out of our control, right? Well, to be honest, most things are out of your control. <laughs> you just don't know yet, right? And so this out of control things that are happening, when we look at it, we can fall into hopelessness. But we need to take a clue here from Abraham and see that in the midst of that hopeless situation, he was not without hope because he knew that he appealed to the Father God who would give him all hope, right? And so he knew to put his gaze there. That's where his hope comes from. We need to be doing that. And in Philippians 2.13, it says, For God is at work within you, giving you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. It's God who indeed is moving here. He's moving to give you the will, circle that, will, and he wants to give you power. He doesn't want to give you willpower. He wants to give you the will to do what he's asking you to do, which is the purpose he has given you in your life. And he wants to infuse you with the power to be able to do this thing. And so as you're facing the year 2017 that we've come into, right? We all want to fulfill that, that God-given purpose that he has placed inside of us. And so we want you to take out and we want you to write down in your, um, in your prayer request, one of the things is, God, help me to understand my purpose more. Give me wisdom. Give me understanding so that I might apply it in my life. We need to be seeking after that with our whole heart, with our whole heart. Now, here's a word that the Father gave me. It's a personal word, I believe, for some of you, okay? You have had dreams, and you have wanted something to go down a way that you thought it should, and for whatever reason, it did not go down the way you wanted it to. And so you've pulled back, and you've lost hope, really, and you struggle. It's like right there at the surface, even now as I'm talking, right? And so God is saying he wants you to deal with this. He wants you to deal with this. I see that. It's almost like you're driving your life. You're in a car and you're driving. And you're so preoccupied with things that have gone on that you're like looking in the rearview mirror and you're trying to drive your life and you're like looking in this rearview mirror. And God says he doesn't want that anymore. He doesn't want you gazing into the past anymore. He wants you to look in the windshield. He wants you to get the whole 360 that he has for your life. He wants to expand that. He wants to shrink that mirror so it no longer affects the way you move and the way you operate. Now, I thought it was by no coincidence that I came in uh, today and got a flyer uh, to join, you know, about the Forgive and Live class that we're being offered in January. Listen, if you're somebody who struggles with looking in that rearview mirror, that is a class that you want to take, right? You want to get prayer. You want to start to get in groups that will help you to tackle that because you're missing out on what God wants for you. Now, the last thing I want to bring with you on how we can partner with allowing the Holy Spirit, this living hope to come forth in our life is number five on your outline. To remember that God's promised to help you, that he's promised to help me. God has promised that he will help us. He says, I'm going to help you. He wants us to be assured. He wants us to walk through life assured that he's going to help us. And in Psalm 119, 81, it says, I expect your help for you have promised it. You know, there are 6,000 promises in the Bible, and he says he wants you to stand. He wants you to stand on those with confidence and to pray to him and to talk to him about that. You were not meant to be alone. Assured, he wants to answer each and every promise. This last scripture, it says, Hebrews 6, 18. It says this, God cannot lie when he makes a promise. He cannot lie when he makes an oath. These things which are the promises these things encourage us they give us strength to hold on to the hope we have been given god wants you to know that he promises to help you and indeed that's what he wants to do so again my call to you is if you're in a place of uncertainty and you're looking at this 2017 year and you're going ah oh, partner up with the Holy Spirit to allow the hope that God has for you to be unpackaged, to remember that God is with you, that he cares for you, that he sees your situation. He's up close and he's personal, right? And he's there to give you the power that you don't have and to help you. 
You just need to turn and face him and start to ask him. Invite him into this, and he will come and he will be with you. Now bow your heads, and I'll close this part in prayer. Oh, Father, how I love you. <laughs> there is none like you, Lord God. You have provided so many gifts for us, Lord. So many. And Father, as you have, have given us this gift of hope, I ask, Father, that those that had ears to hear what your spirit was saying would begin to, to get it, Father, to really to understand that the hope that you want to give them goes beyond the circumstances that they stand in, even at this moment. I hear that. And so, Father, I bind discouragement and I, I bind that hopeless uh, spirit that is on some of you in the name of Jesus. And right now, Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would release and breathe, breathe on Father, breathe on them the new hope that you have for them. I thank you for that, Lord. I hear. And so there are some of you that are in here, and I've been talking about this personal God, and you've heard who God is. You've heard about his son, Jesus Christ, but you never stepped into it and owned it. Well, now is your chance. Start out this year by making that declaration. You can do it right where you're at right now. As all their people's heads are bowed and they're, they're thinking and they're connecting with the Lord, I want to encourage you that is seeking, seeking who this Jesus is in a personal way, that you just pray this prayer right where you're at. It's between you and him. You just say, Father God, go ahead and say that. Say, Father God, I don't understand everything, but I'm reaching out and I'm accepting the forgiveness of my sins that you offer me through your son, Jesus Christ. And I ask you, Jesus, to become the leader of my life. Now, Father, for those that were praying that, I ask that you seal it in their hearts, and I thank you that you promise that you write their name in the book of life and that they become children of the God Most High. And so, Lord, I ask that you would help us to walk out the truths that you presented to us today, Lord. That we wouldn't shrink back, Lord, but rather we would stand up and just like the, the renovation stuff, God, that we would be able to see our God move in a mighty way, knowing that it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with you. It has only us to turn towards you and you will activate our faith. Do big things, Father in the lives of those that are seeking after you this morning. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, so we're going to do a transition here. I know I've gone a little over, but I want to, uh, yeah, we'll have this transition. The usher's going to come forward. They're going to take up the tithes. If you're a guest with us, do not feel pressured to give, um, but rather I would encourage everybody also to write out on your um, program we gave you a prayer request for 2017 and put it in that that bag when it comes around and if we miss you you can put it up in the the box over there and we'll be sure to get it okay so i'm going to release that and i also need to introduce a song that i've asked hannah and the band to sing one that i feel like god wants us to dialogue with him on so give this a listen to
Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.